Supervised PhDs, a podcast series by Tara Brabazon and Steve Redhead. Hello, my name is Tara Brabazon. I'm Steve Redhead. And welcome to the ninth podcast in our series, How to Supervise PhDs. And the ninth one is one that deeply worries me and has worried me for the last three to four years near the end of the time we were in the United Kingdom, certainly in Canada and our return to Australia. And the ninth topic is the issue of publications and indeed the ownership of publications during a doctorate. This is a problem and my priority, my area of concern is I remain worried that PhD students are being exploited by their supervisors in two ways. Firstly, as unpaid or underpaid research assistants. And secondly, supervisors merely adding their name to work that they've done very, very little on. And also, as a head of school, you need to recognise supervisors are paid to supervise. I give workload for it, therefore they are paid to supervise. They're getting money to be superv- to be supervisors, and they're not only getting that money, they're then also getting publications. So th- I've set that scene. This is what's really concerning me. So, Steve, that's my thoughts. What are your thoughts on this role of ownership and publications during a PhD? Certainly my argument is that there is a problem. Yeah. And the principle should be that the student should own their own content. But the thing is so fractious now. This is globally, you're absolutely oh. right. We've experienced it ourselves in different systems. As the system has got, a system globally of higher education, has got more and more frantic, more and more marketized. I think these things have become a much more um, difficult problem to solve. When I started as a PhD supervisor, and, and I think it does depend on different disciplines, but I, I never thought when I started as a PhD supervisor of co-authoring with my students. No. It wasn't a regular thing, certainly in the disciplines that I worked in. But over time, it has become the thing to do. So I looked out of step if I didn't co-author. And as it's become more frantic and the, you know, the job market has become more hyper, the idea of publishing with your students has almost become de rigueur. Yeah. I really do think the change that I'm talking about, I mean, these are over decades, but the change has, is astonishing. So I'm not saying don't do it. No. And I do think, I mean, I do uh, co-author with uh, some of my students. And you, you, you always did, but it was an authentic co-authorship. So you wrote with Goni, respect to Goni, Red yes, but not necessarily when they were doing their PhDs. No. It was post-PhD, yeah. mostly. Um, and the idea that you must publish is the thing, you know, the thing is you must publish. And one way to publish relatively easy, easily is to publish with very good PhD students. Oh, yeah. And I mean, can I just say to the listeners, Steve and I in the last few months have really gone for this. I've done a talk where I made a big deal about saying, it's your work. Don't let people just randomly add your name to it. Don't think that's normal. I've never done it. If I write with a student, I write with a student and I've written half of it and I'll add my name to it. But I have never, ever, ever added my name you know, after having done what is basic supervisory work, so editing, suggesting areas, suggesting topics. People are adding their names to student work just after having done a little bit of editing. But it is different in different disciplines. I mean, for example, I was recently uh, acting head of School of Human Movement at uh, Charles State University, yeah. which included uh, HPE, it included sports journalism, it included exercise science. And in those areas... There was radical difference in terms of publication. And all of, in all of those areas, I had staff who supervised PhD students. Yes. But you know, in some areas, exercise science is a great example. You might have up to eight um, authors. Yeah. And th- that was quite regular, you know, or five or six anyway. Yeah. Um, quite regular. So that you could have a PhD student's work and maybe four supervisors on top of that and in, in, in that suggests to me that you have to look pretty carefully at 
how PhD students are contributing when you talk about co-authoring. I really do think it's it's a major issue. It depends on disciplines, but that the the general issue is PhD students in these times are often actually supporting the publication records of staff, and that's well not what it should be about. Well said. And so, therefore, for the students listening to this, when you're doing your little research project on possible supervisors, look down their list mm. and make sure, particularly, let's, let's just use the humanities as an example, mm. make sure that there is a hell of a lot of that list that is singly authored. And mm. and or if it is co-authored, about a quarter of mine, maybe a fifth of my publication. And that's perfectly okay. okay. It's, but make sure it's an authentic co-authorship. I think. Yeah. So well said, Steve. This is a big deal for us, and this is a big deal for it's the a, academy. It's an, 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 it's a big deal globally, because the same basic economic and market pressures uh, on university staff are are playing out globally. Yeah, and good on you for saying when dinosaurs roamed the earth and you and I were doing our PhDs. Yeah, never thought about it. It, it never thought about it, never happened, and yeah. we've never done it, never done it as supervisors. So don't normalise this and naturalise this. No. There are plenty of people out there that this is just not what they and do. And this is an area where regulation should come in very, very quickly in institutions and, and across the world. Well, let me give you an example where the regulations go in the other way, O regulator. Mm. Question two is... Okay, let's go here. And, you know, we've only seen this in the last few years. What do you think about the frankly bizarre PhD by publication? Not PhD by prior publication. So people have written books and articles and then come to the candidature. You know, we've both supervised those. They're great. I'm talking about this bizarre PhD by publication. Should we talk about what it is first? Yes. Right, well... Because it's not... PhD by prior publication. And I would argue it's not a PhD, but just that's mm. me. Did I say that? Yeah, I did. What this is, is basically at the start of a candidature, a student comes in without any publications and writes publications with their supervisor. And so maybe five, six, seven articles over a two and a half, three year period. And then those articles are bundled up with, I think, a synopsis type thing at the front, like mm. an introduction. And that's submitted as a PhD. Boof, head explosion. Offer your commentary, Steve. Well, I've never supervised like that. And I, I wouldn't want to see that systematically allowed. It should be regulated out, in my Why? view. Because I don't think that's what a PhD is about. I always was actually very sceptical of PhD by prior publication, but I did supervise in the UK, and I found that very uh, really rewarding experience, actually. Yeah. Um, but initially, I was, in, in the past, uh, sceptical about allowing different variations on publications, uh, sorry, on PhD, yes. and particularly those with publications. So I think this one doesn't fit any of my systems. So I think this is not necessarily a system we should be allowing at all. Yeah. Can I just give the most basic reason why it shouldn't exist? And that is, I suppose you and I examine a lot. We examine a great deal, and probably that makes our career a bit unusual as well, that most in most weekends and weeks in this house, one of us has a PhD somewhere mm. that they're examining. We do, so that's, that's the scale of what Which is we're great. talking about. It's lovely. That's right. But the problem is, okay, so we get one of these PhDs by publication with one, well, actually two, three, four authors on each of these inverted commas chapters that are actually articles. Now, how do we as examiners know what this student has written? Yes, you cannot know how much the student has contributed. And they may have done 80%, they may have done 99%, but we cannot know. Yeah. And, you know, at what point... What role has that supervisor had? Mm. How much of that has been written? So mm. what are we actually examining? And then the key is, how is that then equivalent to a guy or gal writing a traditional doctorate, starting from zero to hero, 100% theirs? Mm. How are we comparing those? And how are they getting the same PhD, the same letters at the end? Mm. I, think, I think it's a real issue. I think, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've changed my mind over the years, and I think the idea, and I do encourage my own PhD students to do this, that... Publications within the PhD Terrific. are perfectly okay, single authored. Yes. But I didn't think that at one time. I thought someone should do a PhD and then after that 
do publications. See, I so, never thought that. So no, I have yeah. changed my mind about it, partly because of this marketised, globalised system where the, the international labour market demands people's publications. So the students themselves, if they want to work in universities, have got to get publications almost before they were born. Yes. And this <laughs> is a way of doing it. Yeah. But I agree. There, there's something seriously wrong about this. And again, Steve, I think it's about the power differential with the supervisor. Yeah, I it's know a hierarchy. A, I know a series of supervisors that they talk students out of doing a traditional PhD because they can get more authorship from these PhDs by publications. The supervisor can get more. Yeah, well, the regulation should stop that, either at the university or national level. Yeah, and I think it's being justified, Steve, as, oh, it's good for the student because they get a PhD mm. and seven publications. Yeah. Now, I can see where that economic pressure on the student comes, especially if they want to work in universities. Yeah, or with these the, particular supervisors. The com too. competitiveness uh, of university labour markets is so great. Yeah, so students out there, be careful. Supervisors, reflect upon your own ethics. Last question. Now, how should authorship of publications be talked about? And should supervisors, do you think, add their names to publications? Because this is a series really about supervisors as much as students. So how should we talk about authorship with our students? I think it's, it, it's you know, if, if genuinely, as a student, you're writing with your supervisors, then that's perfectly OK to have co-authorship, and it may be more than one person, uh, reflected properly. I think it's, it's, it's just, that's, that's an ethic within the university system generally. I don't yeah. think it's just to do with uh, students and supervisors. So I think that the most important thing is to accurately, truthfully reflect what's going on. Yeah. What you shouldn't do is add your name without doing any work. Or very, very little work that you're yeah. actually paid for. Yeah paid to do as a supervisor. I mean, Steve, I think that's a great answer because I think this whole debate has been rendered much more complex than it actually is. Yeah. In my first meeting, and you've seen me do it with our students that we share, I have a very, I discuss it meeting number one. Yeah. If I write right. it, it's mine. If you write it, it's yours. If we write it, we put both our names on mm. it. Full stop. That is it. Yes, and so that's I, explicitly agreed. In this series of expectations which you've set up brilliantly I think it is a great way to do it it's almost like a contract I treat it like you know I actually give them a 30 page document and we go it's through brilliant. line it at works. a time to say this it's is clear. how we do things yeah. and also it's recognising you know the, the, the editing the commentary the interpretation on the students work is not authorship that is supervision it is and that's got confused well said. So I hope our views on that have been clear. Ladies and gentlemen, let's move to our last podcast. Here we go, Steve. Thank you for listening to this podcast titled How to Supervise PhDs. Please feel free to contact Steve or Tara at Charles Sturge University. We'd love to hear from you.